Greetings from the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and happy 4th of July. At past July 4th, the National Archives Education and Public Program staff have presented activities and programs inside the National Archives building that have been enjoyed by thousands of families. Although we are unable to do that this year, we are pleased that we can welcome you virtually. We hope that from wherever you are celebrating this day, you will enjoy the following program combining history, food, crafts, and an opportunity for you to meet and ask questions of some very famous Americans. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States and author of the Declaration of Independence, Abigail Adams, a founding mother of the United States and wife and closest advisor to President John Adams, John Dunlap, who printed the first copies of the original Declaration of Independence, known as the Dunlap Broadside. After we hear from them, we will be joined by Sarah Lyons Davis, an education specialist with the National Archives in New York City, who will present a mini lesson and share some related documents from our collection. To get the most out of today's program, please visit archives.gov and download a variety of fun materials and activities for your family to enjoy. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Patrick Madden, who is Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports the work of the National Archives, especially our education and outreach programs. Check out their website, archivesfoundation.org, to learn more about them and join online. Patrick? Thank you, David. And on behalf of the National Archives Foundation, happy July 4th. What a terrific day. We're gonna have so much fun. I like to call it our Super Bowl at the National Archives. We're really excited you're spending part of your holiday with us and we're, we've got a lot for you. We are thrilled to have folks from all 50 states who have RSVP'd to participate in these programs. You couldn't pick a better day to spend with the National Archives. We have a busy day ahead with a big lineup uh, going from right now 11 a.m. Eastern time all the way until 4 p.m. Eastern time followed by the National Archives ceremony and reading of the Declaration of Independence starting at four o'clock. So I hope you'll stick with us all day long. No pandemic was gonna stop us. Uh, we went virtual and so here we are. This is the 50th year that the National Archives is presenting a reading of the Declaration of Independence. Fast fact, did you know that the Declaration of Independence, the original, the one and only signed is at the National Archives. Even the one that went to the King of England didn't have all the founders' signatures. If you've never visited the archives in Washington, D.C., put it on your bucket list when you walk into the rotunda and see the original Declaration, the original Constitution, and the original Bill of Rights, it'll give you goosebumps. In a minute, you'll meet Thomas Jefferson. So I hope you've had a good breakfast. I hope you are ready with some really interesting and patriotic questions and we're gonna get ready to go. You will be able to ask him questions. So use the chat function on YouTube to do that. If you wanna practice right now, send us a chat right now and tell us where you're watching from. We'd love to hear and give your hometown a shout out as we go, go along. When was the last time you hung out with a former president? Well, today's your lucky day. Let me formally introduce an author, a lawyer, an architect, a farmer, an inventor, a former ambassador, a former Secretary of State, and the third president of the United States, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. President Jefferson, how are you doing today? Happy 4th of July. Thank you, Mr. Baden. Happy 4th of July to you as well. My friend, I am doing uh, quite well, and thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to speak with you and your guests today. Uh, there are many ways that we could consider the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. Uh, one of the perspectives from which we can view this document and this day is through the lens of leadership, of which there are many types. The kind that I learned about in 1776 was the leadership of silence. Uh, you often hear about the leadership of courage in the field of combat or the leadership of inspiring speeches, but rarely do you hear about the leadership of silence. That is because of how quiet it is. That is not irony, by the way. <clears throat> In 1776, I was 33 years of age, one of the youngest delegates to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. The youngest were South Carolina's uh, Thomas Lynch Jr. and Edward Rutledge, who were 26 years of age at the time. Uh, actually, no, they were tied at the second youngest, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Pennsylvania's Benjamin Franklin was the youngest. He was 70. You try keeping up with him. In contrast to the famous Dr. Franklin, I was little known. I was also quiet. During the debates on independency, members of Congress had taken sides. They had done so with passionate conviction, which they expressed at great length. Speeches on the floor of Congress lasted for hours. But I never gave a single speech in the building that you now know as Independence Hall. I listened and I took notes. Just as there are different ways of listening, there are different ways of taking notes. I did not take notes to formulate a clever retorts or to point out the flawed logic of my opponents. Instead, I took notes to improve my understanding of what everyone, even those with whom I disagreed, was saying in any dispute over how to solve a commonly agreed upon problem. If there is a person that all sides of the dispute have seen to be earnestly listening and endeavoring to understand all points of view, the entire group will be most likely to entrust that person with the task of bringing them all together to solve the problem by consensus. By my silence and attentiveness, I proved to the rest of the Continental Congress that I was that person. There was a big part, at least in that reason, as to why I received the most votes of any of the five men placed on the committee to write the Declaration of Independence. I worked alone for two and a half weeks in June. The committee made a few changes at the end of the month. Then, over the two days of July 2nd and July 3rd, <clears throat> Congress ruined it. In the end, they made about 85 changes and removed about 20%. I was furious about it. I never got over it. Almost 50 years later, when referring to the changes that Congress had made to the draft of the Declaration of Independence, I referred to them as mutilations and depredations. I nonetheless remained silent at the time. Oh, John Adams defended every word of it. He was truly a colossus of independence. Part of the reason that I remained silent was that if John Adams is speaking for you, you will hardly get a chance to fit a word in edgewise. But that wasn't my only reason for remaining silent as they hacked and chopped at my work. I knew that America was facing a great crisis. It was such a profound crisis that we could solve it only as one people with one mind. A simple majority would not do. And of course, the dominance of the minority's will would cause the machine to retrograde. I knew that we had to use compromise to achieve consensus. I could have stuck to my principles on any one of the alterations Congress made, refusing to compromise when I believed that I was right. Then I would have been able to brag that I had planted my feet and refused to give in. But a braggart is no leader. If I had done that, if we had behaved like that, we would have failed. The result would have been that none of our posterity would care which ones of us had stubbornly refused to sacrifice a little of their opinion or convenience in order to seek consensus for the good of all. Because we would have failed in our revolution and have been branded as traitors. What's worse, had we refused to seek consensus together in that great crisis, we would have deserved being called traitors. If not against Great Britain, then against the hopes of future generations. So I kept my mouth shut until it was time to speak for everyone. And when that time came, I did not use it as an excuse or opportunity to speak for myself alone, to promulgate my own personal opinion, nor did I use that opportunity to speak for my faction. I used that moment to speak for a consensus. I used that moment to speak for the United States of America. John Adams said that in 1776, we had to get 13 clocks to strike at once. Perhaps with your modern machinery, you don't think of that as a very great challenge, but at the time, getting even two clocks to strike in perfect unison was an extremely difficult task. I know, I know it has been brought to my attention that most, if not all of you, carry on your persons devices that can tell them time in minute synchronicity with one another. What's more, they give you miraculous and nearly instantaneous access to the collected wisdom and knowledge of mankind. It has also been brought to my attention that most of you use these wonderful contrivances for the purposes of arguing with strangers and looking at pictures of cats. <clears throat> Before you chuckle at the quaintness of my metaphor, 
however, and that how primitive our technology in my day was compared to yours, consider this. You have multiplied the clocks. You have improved the chronological precision. But have you really improved your ability to get all of your clocks to strike as one, as we did in 1776? Have you improved your ability to work together in a crisis for a common cause, not just for your own good, not merely for your own personal liberty, but for the good of all, for the liberty of all, for the United States of America? In the end, we produced an admittedly imperfect result, but one with which we could proceed as one people. It brought us closer together, which means it did not split us further apart. The reason that you and so many in the United States are making an effort to listen to my words now is because of how quiet I was in 1776. And that, good citizens, is irony. Having said that, I must now tell you that we did not foresee that the Declaration of Independence of the 4th of July would become as important as they eventually became. July 2nd was the day that we had actually voted for the resolution for independence, not July 4th. July 4th was the announcement, the declaration. A resolution is neither a law nor a constitution. A resolution is merely something that represents an instance in which Congress makes up its mind. That happens so very infrequently that we give it a formal title. I agreed with John Adams when he said that July 2nd would be the day that everyone would remember. Even if we didn't necessarily know which specific document or day would become famous, we were all aware of the risk we were taking. Years later, my friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, wrote about the signing ceremony which took place on August 2nd in the following way. He said, do you re recollect the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the house when we were called up one after the other to the table of the President of Congress to subscribe what was believed by many at that time to be our own death warrant? Virginia delegate Benjamin Harrison, who often made jests to the delight of the other delegates, was the only man to dare interrupting the silence and gloom of that morning. And Mr. Harrison was a robust man of formidable stature and girth. He called out to Elbridge Gerry, who was a man of slight stature and almost negligible weight, as Mr. Gerry was about to sign the declaration. And he said, I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gary, when we are all hung for what we are doing. From the size and weight of my body, I shall die in a few minutes and be with the angels, but from the lightness of your body, you will dance in the air an hour or two before you are dead. It was meant as a jest at the time. I have trouble recalling any laughter on that August 2nd when we signed the Declaration of Independence, but there may have been a little uncomfortable laughter at that moment. By that time, the document had already begun to build a kind of momentum of meaning and impact based on the responses it was generating when read aloud to crowds across the United States. On July 8th, when it was read aloud for the first time in Philadelphia, at noon by Colonel John Nixon in front of the Pennsylvania State House, you, you now call it Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the citizens of the town responded after the reading with loud huzzas, after which a group of militia marched into the State House, removed the king's coat of arms from the wall, dragged it through the streets, and then burned it in a bonfire. After the Declaration of Independence was proclaimed, read aloud, to a crowd in New York City, a group of citizens there marched to a statue of King George III and pulled the statue down, horse and all. They tore the statue to pieces. It was a lead statue, and parts of it were melted down to make bullets to be used by patriots in the fight against the soldiers of King George III. By the next year, 1777, people were already commemorating the 4th of July, not only in America, but in France as well. Benjamin Franklin, who was representing the United States in France, held a festive dinner at his home in Passy to commemorate the day. The document grew in importance still, not only in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Revolutions in France and Poland drew inspiration from the words in that document in the 1780s. And as the 19th century dawned, revolutions in South America 
drew inspiration from the Declaration of Independence as well. Those revolutions were flawed, as was ours. If I may speak a little bit beyond the Declaration of Independence for, for just a moment. Uh, there are those who would say that the Constitution is a mess. So it needs amendments. Those same individuals might further protest that it is full of contradictions. So is independence. We have to start somewhere. July 4th, 1776, all men are created equal. This is where we started. This is the notion of why we celebrate this nation today. On July 4th, 1776, though there was not an original idea in the Declaration of Independence, I, I made sure of that. I'm a lawyer. We, we do that. We did something original. By voting to approve those five words, all men are created equal, as the basis for our revolution, for the first time in the history of the world, a people established a new land with a goal in mind at its very inception. Our goal is hidden between the lines of those five words. All men are created equal. If you're an American, you share that goal. No matter where you live, no matter where you were born, if you share that goal, an important part of you is American. Our goal is this. One day in America, all men, meaning all mankind, ladies, you too, will be treated as they are created, as equals. But I wonder how long it will take for us to achieve that goal. A century? Two centuries? We will have achieved that goal by the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in the year 2026. As future generations contemplate the efforts of my generation, I hope they do not fall into one of two traps. The first would be to reject what we did accomplish because we did not accomplish everything, to throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. The second, equally dangerous of the traps, would be to reject acknowledgement of our failures because of respect for our successes. After all, sometimes the baby does need a bath. Because that would be to reject their right to improve on what we started and their responsibility to move us closer generation by generation to the goal that defines us as a people and we are defined by a goal. We are not defined by the blood that runs in our veins. We are not defined by the soil upon which we were born. One of the three greatest men who ever lived, Isaac Newton, once said that if he had seen further than those who had come before him, it was because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. If I could say one thing to future generations of Americans as they contemplate the great anniversary festival of July 4th, and what we accomplished in my generation, I might exhort them thus. If you look up to our successes, do not feel too low. If you look down on our failures, do not feel yourselves too lofty either. You can see further than we could see. You can reach higher than we could reach. Of course you can. We are holding you up on our shoulders. Thank you so much, President Jefferson. That was terrific. And if you're so inclined and have a few more minutes for us on this busy day, would you be willing to take some questions from our guests? Oh, I'd be delighted to, Mr. Madden. Delighted, yes. Excellent. We have. Uh, we have folks from all over the nation with us. Uh, some places you might be familiar with, like Alexandria, Virginia, and New York City, and Philadelphia, South Carolina. But we've also got some, uh, some parts of the country that you might not be familiar with, uh, California, and, uh, and even actually a Scottish island is uh, joining us today. So it's, uh, it's quite wonderful. We've got all, all folks from all around. Um, you know, we have had a couple of questions. I'm curious... You did a lot of writing during your time. What kind of pen did you use to write the declaration? Was it the same as all of your other pens? Or was it a special pen? Well, I'm afraid at the time I didn't really have, uh, let me see here if I have, oh, there we are. I didn't really have a favorite pen, but uh, nor did I have a favorite source for the pens, but my pens look like this right here. They came from geese, I used goose quills. I didn't always uh, keep, the plumage there, the feather on it, sometimes I would carve them down because it might be a little bit, sometimes it was more convenient to just have the vein there of the feather and then you'd, you'd take your, a pen knife and carve off the edge of it there and because of the vein nature, the intravenous nature of a goose quill, it would soak up the ink very well from an inkwell such as this one here. And 
you would have enough ink soaked up on the quill like that that you could write for a little while until you had to dip it again. I don't have any ink on it right now, as you can see, though. Uh, as time went on, I developed a number of different kinds of writing implements and tinkered with them, but that was the kind I used to write the Declaration of Independence. Very good. Um, I want to remind our viewers that you can ask questions in the chat of YouTube. We've got a few more for you. Uh, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but uh, one of our guests asked, why were the references uh, to free slaves left out of the Declaration of Independence? I included in my original draft of the Declaration of Independence a paragraph condemning slavery. There are a number of reasons why it was removed, partially because I don't think I'd, it was my best paragraph, not because it condemned slavery or had anything to do with slavery one or the other, because I included that paragraph in the list of grievances and the grievance against King George III, the way I wrote that, that paragraph, it could have been construed that I was blaming King George III entirely for slavery, which of course wasn't true. So that was one of the excuses, or at least one of the uh, criticisms of the paragraph. Uh, it was also in the list of grievances where Slavery wasn't the actual grievance, it was something else. So there were those who criticized the, the style and the, the, even the mentioning of slavery in that place at that time in the, in the document. Uh, so they used that as an excuse. It seemed like I was blaming King George III entirely. But if they had really believed that, they could have just adjusted the paragraph. They adjusted a lot. They changed a number of things. Sometimes they uh, toned things down. Sometimes they made things a little bit hyperbolic when they hadn't been to begin with. Uh, they didn't just cut things out when they wanted to change things. In this case, though, they said, well, we don't like the way that's written, so we're just going to cut out the whole mention of slavery altogether. So I ever after believed that the reason why it was cut out altogether was because there were a lot of people in Congress who didn't want to talk about slavery at all. Because if you start talking about a problem and everybody's allowed to share information and you, and you talk about a problem in a rational, reasonable situation where documentable facts uh, are the basis upon which everyone uh, works with their arguments, well, you're going to have a chance of solving the problem. And those folks who don't want to solve a problem, you'll see when you get in discussions, they'll try to stop that reasonable conversation. They try it by cutting it completely short, like Congress did with the paragraph condemning slavery by just silencing it. Or there are other ways to solve a reasonable conversation by using logical fallacies. So without yelling or screaming or saying offensive words, you can still stop a reasonable conversation by in you, logical fallacies is a short way to put it, but engaging in the discussion in a way that undermines fundamentally the possibility uh, for a reasonable conversation. In this case, they, they undermine the possibility for a reasonable conversation about slavery altogether by silencing it altogether. I, I ever went, uh, I went through the rest of my life believing they just wanted to silence it. Very good, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in, so I'll, I'll try and get through uh, uh, many of them as we can. Uh, what were, what is something you're most proud of, your most proud accomplishment of your life? Well, of my public accomplishments, I would name three things. Yes, I know, I'm giving you three answers when you ask for only one, but you should be used to that. I'm a politician and a lawyer. I would name three things for which I would most want to be remembered, and that is that I was the author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. Very good. Uh, freedom of speech has, has come up a couple of times. What would you say to people, I know you traveled uh, abroad during your time, to people, um, we have the freedom of speech in our country. Um, what was your experience with freedom of speech in other countries? And what would you say to people maybe today who don't enjoy those freedoms? We, John Adams would say we never have had fully, full freedom of speech. Uh, and to a certain degree, he was right. But we've enshrined it in our constitution and, the, and, and I'm glad we have. I think it's the most important amendment, the first amendment. When Mr. Adams said we don't have freedom of speech, he meant that there are things you can say and write that hurt other people and can be proved as intentionally hurting other people. And if you hurt other people, if you, or that infringe other people's rights, it might be a better way to put it. Uh, and there are also things you can say and write, do with your speech that infringe the liberty of the whole country, of, of the whole people. Even while you are exercising your personal liberty, if you exercise your personal liberty for the express purpose or with the clear and direct result of infringing or under, completely undermining the liberty of the whole country, that is in 
some ways definitive of the line between uh, the line between your exercise of personal liberty and the rights of the community, the rights of the country. So there are some countries, though, that don't even have a conversation about what that balance is, because that balance, we didn't solve it in my day. Mr. Adams and I disagreed about where that balance, where that balance struck uh, its happy medium, its golden mean uh, in my day, and the conversation may not be solved in your day either, but at least we're having that conversation. The Constitution doesn't give us answers. It codifies a conversation. First Amendment does that. So we have codified in our found, one of our founding documents a conversation about what freedom of speech means, how you balance your personal liberties, your personal conveniences and comforts, with the liberty of the whole. There are other countries that simply do not have that conversation at all. They're not allowed to have it at all. I hope that we, as a people, it, through our behavior and through the way we exercise that very dangerous and very important right of freedom of speech, can continue to act as a, as a light to other countries, a light of hope as to what they might achieve with a responsible application, a responsible meaning informed and reasonable application of that right of the freedom of speech. Mm, that's very, uh, very helpful. We've actually had a couple other questions about the constitution. Um, you obviously, there was debate, there was compromise. Uh, what changes would you make to the constitution? I actually suggested a few right away. I don't know how if Mr. Madison appreciated that too much. Some of the changes I suggested were already made. I thought that having, well, first of all, I, I don't know if, if you're gonna make this change, but I thought that having no term limits for the president of the United States is extremely dangerous. I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I didn't like when the constitution was originally made that there, were no, there was no bill of rights. We technically don't have a bill of rights. What we call the bill of rights are just the first 10 amendments. The bill of rights, really has to happen before a constitution because it's supposed to be the groundwork upon which the constitution is built, not changes made afterward. So that change was never strictly speaking made to it. I wanted to see an amendment made that protected us against permanent professional standing armies. Uh, there, were, there was a, a compromise, a messy compromise made in the constitution, which seemed to protect us against permanent standing armies. I thought the states ha should have, the, 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 the Second Amendment says that states should have uh, the authority over the militias and the federal government shouldn't have an army at all. So this, you know, the people are closer to the wielding of that military power. So I'd like to see a protection of that. I'd also like to see an amendment added that protects us from monopolies uh, as well. I talked about that a lot uh, in a number of my letters over the years. So those are a few changes I'd like to see uh, made to the document. But, uh, but really, that's just in my lifetime. I think that there ought to be a, a constitutional invention every single generation. I think you should have a revolution, not with guns and blood, but well, like we had in 1787, 76 to 87, have a revolution in the minds of the American people. And you should change the constitution to whatever works for you every single generation, because the earth belongs to the living, not to the dead. Very good. Um, a question, how do you view, you mentioned this a little bit in your remarks, uh, uh, the view of the evolution of the phrase, all men are created equal. I saw that, I saw that phrase, you, you say this word evolution, that is, that is a, a fascinating way to, to phrase it. I saw the word, people apply the word with different meanings in my lifetime. Uh, I saw other, I mentioned earlier when I opened with my remarks that other revolutions in other continents, other places uh, began using the Declaration of Independence for inspiration. And as we're running out of time, this might actually be my last question I can answer, uh, but a good one to end on. Um, I saw, for instance, Saint-Domingue, which, which you would know as Haiti, began using the words of the Declaration of Independence for their revolution. Slaves on, on Saint-Domingue used it. Uh, so, so I saw the words in that, even though I'm, I myself am a slave owner, I saw slaves on an island off of the coast of North America using it, the words I wrote as justification for their, their revolution. And I couldn't argue, with the, I couldn't argue with, with the logic of that. I saw it happening in South America and in Europe. I saw people demanding rights. Mr. Adams and I both talked about this in our letters, people demanding rights that we had not contemplated that they would have during my lifetime. Uh, as time goes on though, I think I, I, I would like to view the changing application of my words and, and, and the invention of your own words for each generation uh, be something that could still center around all men are created equal. Because ultimately, when I said all men are created equal, I didn't just mean me and the men who were in power in my day. I meant the whole human race. And so to those of you who are listening right now, I meant you. You are our equals. 
That's what that means. What, however, however you need to apply that, that's what it means. We're not your superiors. And as a matter of fact, you're more than our equals because you've learned from our mistakes. You've learned from our successes. You can actually do better than us. Now, I may sound unpatriotic when I say that, but I'm Thomas Jefferson, so I'm allowed to. <laughs> you can do better than us. That's what all men are created equals, equal means. So if you think that you can do better than Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, or you can definitely do better than Alexander Hamilton or Benjamin Franklin or any of us, congratulations, you can. But now, the only thing left to do, now that you know that, now that you know that that's what all men are created equal means, is you have to get up and go out and do it. Wonderful, thank you. I do have one, two quick questions. I think some of our young uh, viewers have asked. I think you can answer real quickly. One, do you like fireworks? I am a man who likes quiet. I'm sorry to the children who may have asked that. I, I built my home on top of a mountain in an era when people just didn't do that. Plumbing was a problem, among other things. I do, I, I like quiet. I, like, I don't like situations that are so loud you can't hear each other. I appreciate the sentiment behind it. And if you like fireworks, that's what's important. You don't have to like what I like. Well, and then I heard that you like, you used to like mac and cheese. Is that true? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I uh, came across a machine when I was traveling in Europe, in Italy, that made the, the special little kind of pasta uh, that, that you are familiar with, with, with what you call macaroni. And I just took notes on the machine, brought, brought a, my diagram of the machine back, had it built. Uh, when I served as president of the United States, now, I, I served it at meals, but I didn't serve it. I didn't cook it. I had a French chef, Petit, and he taught one of my enslaved chefs, Edith Hearn Fawcett. She apprenticed under him during my presidency. And then when I returned to Monticello in my retirement, uh, Edith Hearn Fawcett, she was the chef who was in charge of all the cooking at Monticello, and she was the one who cooked the macaroni and cheese. Uh, yes, I very much enjoy macaroni and cheese. Excellent. Well, I'm getting hungry now. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time today and for celebrating July 4th. It's really been wonderful. Um, we're gonna move on with our program and I'm gonna turn it over to our friends at the National Archives in New York City. Sarah, uh, Education Specialist Sarah Lyons Davis has a fun activity for everybody watching. Sarah? Thank you, Patrick. If you've ever visited the National Archives in Washington, DC, you've likely been in our rotunda, which holds the founding documents of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, also known as the Charters of Freedom. The Declaration of Independence announced its intent to the world. The 13 colonies would no longer be under British rule. They would separate and form a new and independent nation, the United States of America. The Declaration of Independence concludes with these words. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The signers of the Declaration were risking everything, their lives, their fortunes, and their honor, because they felt the cause of an independent country that would have a fair and just government was even more important. Also in the rotunda, visitors see a mural by artist Barry Faulkner of allegorical or symbolic scenes depicting the writing and adoption of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The powerful men who crafted these documents are shown, but Faulkner did not include everyone who had a part in the creation of our country. The everyday women and men who may not have had a voice in the Continental Congress and halls of power also contributed to the independence of our nation in incalculable ways. In the mural of the Declaration, we see John Adams, but not his fellow patriot and wife, Abigail. We'll hear from her a little later today in our program. We know that there are limitations of the phrase, all men are created equal. The reality of the time was that women and people of color were not included. 
They fought for freedom from the king in Great Britain, while also risking their lives and places in society for what they believed to be right. Crispus Attucks, a man of African-American and American Indian descent, is believed to be one of the first casualties of the Revolutionary War, killed during the Boston Massacre. The founders did not live by the words they engrossed on these documents. However, the words have a universal quality that have inspired Americans throughout our history. The Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution, protects Americans' rights to fight for change and help realize the ideas that all men are created equal. To make we the people mean all the people. After the Civil War, several amendments to the Constitution were ratified, extending civil rights to African Americans, beginning with the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment extended citizenship to formerly enslaved individuals born in the United States. Congress chose to address civil rights with a constitutional amendment. On June 13, 1866, Congress approved a joint resolution proposing the amendment to the Constitution, including three significant provisions of equal protection under the law, due process, and citizenship. The Citizenship Clause ensures that anyone born in the United States, regardless of race, color, or familial status, was automatically a U.S. citizen. The clause made citizenship a fixed condition, taking the issue out of the realm of politics where laws could be overturned and rights revoked. By February 3, 1870, three quarters of the states ratified the 15th Amendment, promising that the right of male U.S. citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. While a great victory for black men, many others, including women and members of Native communities, were still excluded. Citizenship was not extended to American Indians until the 1924 Snyder Act, and even after that, many states used Native Americans' unique status to deny suffrage as U.S. citizens. It was not until 1962 that all states guaranteed voting rights to Native peoples. Furthermore, Full delivery of the promise of the 15th Amendment was postponed as some states took steps to limit or deny black men their constitutional right to vote. Discriminatory practices were still enacted by several states, disenfranchising communities and putting obstacles to voting in place, such as poll taxes and literacy tests. It would be almost another hundred years before further acts were passed strengthening protections of this amendment. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 focused primarily on enfranchising African Americans in the South. The act and its extensions also safeguarded the voting rights of many other minority Americans. Within months of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 being signed, a quarter of a million African American voters were registered to vote. This photograph of a polling place in Alabama reflects the unprecedented numbers of voters that turned out. Much like the original revolutionary acts that established the United States, these actions were supported by people working for what they believed to be right and working for expanded protections under the law. These momentous decisions were made on both a personal and community level with great risk to both. At the end of the revolution, not all delegates to the Second Continental Congress signed the declaration because they felt reconciliation with Britain was still possible. Would you have signed? You can walk through the exercise and make this decision yourself on Docs Teach, the online tool for teaching with documents from the National Archives. In the activity, to sign or not to sign, you can imagine that you're a member of the committee tasked with writing the Declaration of Independence. Consider the arguments made by members of the Second Continental Congress and ultimately decide to add your signature or not. There's also a printable copy of the declaration, including in the materials shared, if you'd like to use the quill pen and ink we're about to make to sign it. While you think about that decision, you may want to get your materials together. 18th century documents were often signed with quill pens and ink. Those are not so common now, but we have instructions for how you can make your own at home. So I'm going to demonstrate and hope you'll create them alongside me. But be sure to have a grown-up help, as we will be using knives to cut the quill and creating our ink may get messy. So let's start with our ink. 
This is fun, but as I said, it can get a little messy, so be sure to begin your project in a space that won't be harmed by a little berry juice. So I have all the components to this section already on my workspace. I'm using fresh blackberries, but you can use frozen and thawed berries too. So any type will work, but I found blackberries to have the deepest color ink, so that's what I chose. So I'm using a mortar and pestle to crush the berries and then strain the juice. But you can always skip this part of the steps and crush them directly through the strainer to get the pulp-free juice. So as you can see, you just gotta mush it all together to make kind of a liquidy paste with the berries. And this is gonna be what is the base of our ink. And you can see that deep, really rich blackberry color. And again, so that's gonna show up better on paper than maybe a lighter berry you could choose. So from there, when we have sufficiently mix that together, we're gonna add half a teaspoon of vinegar to hold the color. So that's what I have in this glass, and I'm adding it to the crushed strained berry juice. And I'm also gonna add a half teaspoon of salt, and this acts as a preservative. So we're gonna mix this all together. And this is gonna give us our ink once this is done. So to show you my final result, I've already added our ink to a washed baby food jar, which is acting as my ink well. So now from here, we have to create our quill pen. So once you have all your materials ready, you wanna select your feather. So you see we have a few of these feathers here. So what you want is a feather long enough to hold comfortably. You can leave the feather as is, or you can trim the sides for several inches to leave more room for a better grip. So I'm gonna leave it as is. But you're gonna make a mark with a pen or a marker where you want your writing tip to be. So for me, that's gonna be right here. So I'm now gonna take my X-Acto knife. You can use a sharp kitchen knife as well and cut the end of the quill at a slant less than 45 degrees. I'm just gonna follow the regular kind of slant of this feather. You can see I'm doing this on a cutting board to save, save my work surface here. And I'm just gonna smooth that out a little bit. And there we go, we now have a quill pen. So I'm gonna take the ink, you can dip your new quill pen into your ink, and you are set to go. So see, and you can write with it just as you would. And you have to dip it a little more than you might be used to, but you see the, the deep color that we get from this blackberry juice. There we go. Can't wait to see what you all create. So remember to share what you create with us and you can tweet us using the hashtag archives July 4th. Thanks, Sarah. We'll be hearing from her again next hour. Well, this has been a terrific program. Before we wrap, I'm sure you're curious where you can get one of these hoodies that you could actually salute, or you may be inspired to get your own copy of the Declaration of Independence. Or we have fantastic shirts like this one, Hamilton, Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Madison, and Burr. They're all at the National Archives store online. The e-store can be found at archivesfoundation.org. And today and only today, we're gonna to have a 50% off the entire site. If you use the code LIBERTY50, that's the word LIBERTY and the number 50, you get 50% off. When you visit our website, hopefully you'll look around and see some of the other programs that we do in Washington and around the country. Uh, the efforts of the National Archives Foundation support the outreach that the National Archives does year round. We need to thank our sponsors for today, John Hancock and AARP. They're terrific partners and without their support, July 4th with the National Archives would not be possible. And of course, our members of the foundation who support us year round. I hope you'll tune in shortly at 12 o'clock for Abigail Adams. She has much to say about the founding. And on behalf of the National Archives and the National Archives Foundation, we wanna thank you for spending part of your day with us. While you're waiting for the next program, it's a perfect opportunity to tweet or post about the day. Use the hashtag archivesjuly4 
and send us a little patriotic social love. Until we meet again, wave your flags, enjoy the patriotic day, and happy 4th of July.